<laughs> everywhere man thank you all so much for joining us today hopefully today is going to be, be a very helpful session this session is ideal for those of you that are just getting started and we want to make sure that you feel comfortable using the tools so you'll also notice a little q a option down in the bottom right. So as you have questions, feel free to populate them there. We're going to save some space towards the end of this workshop for Q&A. And also we have a, a special little surprise at the end. Um, one quick thing, let's just do some introductions myself. I am Miggy. I'm a designer advocate here at Figma, and I am joined by Alex. You can see Alex is in the file with me. She's telling y'all, hey, everyone, how you doing? I'm going to tell Alex, hi, Alex, because in Figma is a, a, a place where you get to be collaborative and you get to work with others. So it's so much more than just design. It's all about collaboration and productivity uh, and, and just working with folks. Just so y'all know, today we are going to be working out of a file. And because there's so many of you in this webinar, we can't be in this file together. However, we've thought about that. So if you head on over to figma.com slash at education, and Alex is going to be sharing a link directly in the chat so you can join in, um, you will see that there is a file. This is a file that when you click on it, you can open this directly in Figma and it contains the entire workshop. So all of the starting activities, the things that we're doing today can be duplicated into your Figma drafts if you already have an account. So you can use that to follow along today. So once again, if you go to figma.com slash at education, that is where you can get our templates and you can duplicate them and you can work with them. So it's the Figma Design 101. That is the basics that we have here today. All right. So, oh, here. Thank you, Alex. There, there was an extra slide that, uh, that I neglected to include for today. But just so y'all know that this session is being recorded, make sure you set that Zoom chat to everybody. And just remember that by being on this live stream, you are abiding by and bound to Figma's code of conduct. Essentially, what that means is please be kind. If you want to review that code of conduct, check out figma.com slash code dash of dash conduct. Uh, and just remember, please do not share LinkedIn URLs in the webinar chat. No links in the chat. We want to make sure that we're sharing links with y'all and that we're providing helpful content. So please no spamming of the chat. And just so y'all know, I know a few of you have already asked this question. This session is being recorded. You will be able to view it later by registering and being a part of this live stream. We will send you an email with the recording as well as it will be aired on Figma's YouTube as well. So you'll be able to find it there. All right, cool. So a couple quick things. Figma and FigJam are free for students and educators. So if you are just learning this tool, if you are in a design boot camp, if you are, you know, a higher ed or above, you can head on over to figma.com slash education. When you do, you will see that there's this option to be verified. So if you are in a university situation, if you are a student that is uh, 13 or above, you can go ahead and sign up and get verified. You will be presented with a form and then you will have the option to create education teams. If you are part of our K-12 program. So if you are K-12, if you are a student that is under 13, you definitely want to check out instead figma.com slash education slash Chromebooks. Uh, so then this way you can get started. It's a slightly different process. This is to make sure that you are working in a COPA and FERPA compliant based environment. So if you are a K-12 educator or a younger student, please check out this alternative option option. And it is des designed specifically for you all. All right, cool. So uh, as I mentioned, if you are like a uh, 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 college or above, if you are in a design boot camp, if you are learning a Coursera course, you can sign up to verify and make an education team. So sign up for Figma, verify your education status, create an education team. I will show you very briefly what that is. I'm going to head back to my 
files. I'm going to come down here and I can create a new team. And you might think, well, why am I creating a new team? Think of a team as either as a classroom space where you can collaborate with others or as a personal space where you can organize your files. So in the uh, product world, you know, we use those as teams. Uh, so for yourself, thinking of yourself as a learner and educator, you can use it as a classroom space and or your individual space. So I will show you, hit that create team. I'll just go back. I'll show you one more time all the way down here because I have a lot of teams. You go create new team. When you go to create that team, you'll notice as long as you are verified for education, which I already am, you'll see professional free for students and educators. We're going to go ahead. We're going to choose that. You want to name that team. So what is given to you free are these pro teams. I'm going to enter a name. I'm just going to say education team 101. Um, next, it's going to uh, basically say, hey, you know, this is going to be free as long as this is an educational team. I'm going to choose yes up here. I'm going to review that. I agree to Figma's terms and I complete that upgrade. So now I have this team. Now, what you can get when you have files in a team are unlimited version history. You're going to have the ability to collaborate with as many other education users as you want. And you can use advanced features such as publishing component libraries, using video in your prototypes, as well as using advanced prototyping, which gives you the ability to set variables, conditionals, and a bunch of other stuff. But since this is a basics Figma 101, we're going to just kind of go back to where we were. Let me just go to my recents. And we're going to start from there. We're going to go right into that workshop and we're going to cover some of the basics of Figma. Um, so in this workshop, we're going to be covering Figma's design tool. So we're going to walk through Figma's tools and navigation. So Figma's tools are designed for teams that work together on design projects or product design. Uh, so we're going to walk through how to use some of those tools, how to familiarize yourself with the interface. We're we're going to talk about making sh shapes, text, and images. And if you've joined me before, we're going to get a little bit more in depth and I'm going to cover some of the kind of hidden features there as well. So then this way you can get a good, well-rounded understanding of how best to use these features. Then we're going to talk about resizing elements and using constraints. So this is something that's often overlooked when folks are learning Figma. It's a very important aspect of the process to understand how things are responsive responsive, how things resize, and how you can set constraints. So we're going to introduce that concept and walk you through it. And then if we have enough time, we're going to cover layouts and components. Then we'll have a, a bit of a Q&A. So as mentioned, this is a Figma Design 101, and those are the topics that we're going to be covering today. So right now I am in the Figma interface. You can see me navigating around this space. I'm holding down the space bar and clicking and dragging so I can move around that space. So what I am doing is I am navigating the canvas and you can see if I zoom out, there's actually quite a lot of canvas for me to work in. So understanding how you can pan around that canvas is going to be integral to your success in Figma. So with me, I'm using a mouse, I'm holding down the space bar and dragging as I move around. You'll also notice that if you have a touchpad, you can use your, your, your touchpad to uh, pan around in the same way that you might you know, swipe around a space. However, there's also the hand tool. Many people work different ways. Sometimes people really just want to click on the hand tool to move around. The way that you navigate back to the typical tool that you'll use most often, which is known as the move tool, you're going to press the V key. So notice when I click right here, I see that move tool. Let's make that interface just a little bit bigger for those of you in the back so you can see it. Move tool V. So I'm constantly either pressing escape or V to go back to this move tool. And then I push the space bar to pan around. So you might see me move in that way. The next thing you need to consider is how to zoom in and out. There's many different ways to zoom in and out. If you pay attention to the top right corner here, you're going to see this number. This is your zoom options. And it's going to show you that you can easily zoom to 100%. You can zoom out. I'm going to use 
use the command key or if you're on Windows, control key, plus and minus to zoom in and out. Um, you can also use pinch gestures on your, your laptop's touchpad. Or for me, I'm using a mouse. So I hold the command key while scrolling. It could also be the control key on Windows. So when I hold down that command key, I can scroll up and in and out. So it's essential to kind of learn what ways work best for you when you're beginning to navigate this canvas. Oftentimes we can forget the more experienced we become in Figma that these basics, you know, really help folks out. So if you have been familiar with this before, if you're going to be teaching others, it's important for everyone to get a baseline on how to navigate and move through the canvas. All right. So another thing here about this file, you'll notice to the left, we have pages. So as I am on this main canvas, I'm navigating around, I can also navigate these pages. And if you're thinking to yourself, Mig, I know that, but it can often be very, you know, I spend a lot of mouse miles or mouse meters, you know, because we got a lot of international folks here, you know, only in the US we'd be using miles. But here I can cut on over and uh, uh, I have to click and that I, I could spend a lot of time doing that. So uh, on my keyboard, I push page up or page down, and that allows me to easily move through those pages. I can also, if I'm on a keyboard and I don't have a page up or page down, I can push the function key and page up and function key page down. So those are going to give you the ability to navigate that space just a little bit better. And speaking of, right? Um, I've, I've, I'm, I kind of cover a lot of shortcuts. Uh, and the reason I do a lot of shortcuts is it allows me to move through the interface better. So I'm going to show you how to quickly access those shortcuts. If you take a look at the Figma toolbar in the top left and you hover over all of the items, every item that you hover over, you will see its corresponding shortcut uh, next to it. So rectangle R. When I click that little down menu, right? When I click on that little chevron, I could see rectangle rectangle, line, arrow, ellipse, those shortcut keys are going to allow you to perform the actions that you're regularly performing, you know, over and over again. If you find yourself doing something a lot, make sure you learn that shortcut key. I know that there can be a lot of shortcut keys. They can become overwhelming. So I usually focus in on the ones that are most essential to me as I'm working. So here we got the pen tool. And if you click on that F, you'll actually notice a whole host of different options that are available within the file, and it can be easily overwhelming to kind of move through them all. So what I'm going to introduce you all to today is the quick actions key. So when I click here, you'll see quick actions. Quick actions allows you to more um, easily access the functions in the file. So right here, quick actions, there's different ways to access it. So, you know, in the US, you typically can use command and forward slash or control or forward slash. However, if you're joining us and you have a different configuration keyboard, either command P or control P might also work for you better. So right here, this is what you'll see when you trigger the quick actions. I'm going to scroll up here just so I have some blank screen real estate. So you can see me trigger it. I'm going to hit command forward slash and you'll see the quick actions. Once again, I can hit command P or control P if you're on Windows and I can type something in here that I want to happen. So if I type in, let's say, you know, version history, right? I can see version history of my documents. Uh, let me delete those letters. Let's say if I type in keyboard shortcuts, right? There's a panel for keyboard shortcuts. And so I'm going to click on that in just a second. I just want to show you one more. Let's say collapse layers, right? These different functions that you might want to perform in Figma, you can use the quick actions menu to then type them in to perform that function. So let's go ahead and I'm going to type in keyboard shortcuts. And what that's going to do is bring up this panel at the bottom of my page. This keyboard shortcuts pane is going to give me the ability to see all of the keyboard shortcuts and their associated functions. So move tool, frame tool, 
pen tool, right? And this is actually how I learned Figma. I learned Figma by going through the keyboard shortcuts menu. So then that way I could see a lot of the functions that I might've been familiar with in another application. So previously I used tools like Photoshop, Illustrator, Sketch, um, and I wanted to see what types of parody or what types of features that, that they might also have in Figma that might make a little bit of sense to some of the tools I might've used previously. Previously. So here, flip horizontal, flip vertical, these are pretty common operations when you're designing things on a canvas. So being able to trigger these are really going to help you out a lot. So here we go. And one thing for all of you joining us in, uh, and you might say, hey, Mig, these keyboard shortcuts don't work for me. I have a different layout keyboard than your traditional QWERTY keyboard. You can go to layout and over here, keyboard layout, and you can see some of the different uh, uh, additional layouts that we have. Um, so we have everything from generic to Swedish, and we are working on adding more as well. So you can see those different layouts, and then you will see your respective keyboard shortcuts available in this pane that is specific to your layout. All right, cool. So. Just kind of covering that. Let's just see if there's any questions. Someone asked, will this be recorded? Yes, this is being recorded and it will be shared out uh, in your email. So totally being recorded. Okay, cool. So now let's start getting into actually adding stuff to our canvas and covering some of these tools here. The text tool is going to be the first one that we're going to cover. And this is often overlooked, right? So we add text and we want to format it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to press the T key, pressing the T key, and I can click and I can draw out a bit of text. When I add this text, you will notice that it now gets added over here in the layers panel. I'm adding it directly to the canvas so you can see it represented there. I can just say, hello, comma, world. Um, and then if I want to add an emoji, I'm going to hit, for me, it's going to be command, control, space bar. Um, everybody has a different emoji picker depending on their OS. I'm just going to drop that emoji there just so you can kind of see it uh, plainly. So I've added that to the canvas. However, it doesn't end there. When you select your text and when you select any object in Figma that may be on your canvas, when you come over here, you can see the properties to modify it, right? So here I can change, let's say the font. Now, those of you who may have used Figma, you know, maybe a few months ago, maybe you're just refreshing yourself. We now have a new font picker that allows you to sort by popular fonts. It can sort by Google fonts. It can sort by variable fonts. So here I can choose a font and I can actually see its preview prior to applying it to the canvas. So here I can click and I can search fonts as well. So let's say if I'm looking for Playfair, right? I could type in Playfair and choose Playfair display and I can see that font there. Here I could change the weight of the font so long as it has additional weights. And one thing I wanted to highlight here, if the font is a variable font, that means it is designed in such a way as to have more granular control over its weight and its styles. I can click on those axes right there and I can adjust it right like so. So I'll show you that one more time. When I select the text here, I could change its weight. And if I realize that it has variable font axes, I can actually have much more granular control of how that is being represented there. So I like to, you know, throw in a little bit of, of advanced features into these demos as well. So when working with this, another thing that you need to consider is uh, you're going to be working with multiple lines of text. You know, I could say, how are you doing today? And you might have noticed that as I typed, right, we have this bounding box for my text. However, the text is kind of like sitting outside of it. Right here in this innocuous little kind of like window here are the three modes for your text. It can either be auto width, 
where it's basically expanding to fit on one line. So let's say if you have like title text that may only be on one line and you want that to grow, that would be auto width. However, we also have auto height and auto height will have a fixed width. So if I, let's see, if if I continue typing, right, when I change that width, it's going to wrap the text. So if you use other applications, this auto height behaves more like a text field, right? And if you just type in text on its own, it's going to be auto width. This is an important distinction to have when you begin designing. And it's something that's often overlooked is this mode for your text. In addition, there's also fixed sizing where you define the bounds of your text field. Let's say you have a, a social media post that you're designing uh, or, you know, uh, uh, within like a product app that you're making and you want to align the text to this field, you'll notice here, this text field, let's say I wanna center the text within the text field, I can align it to the middle or I can align it to the bottom. And when it is aligned to the bottom, right? The text grows from the bottom. Let me just make sure. Oh, you'll notice now we have, we have spell check, spell check is a great thing to have. It wasn't always included in Figma, but it's a new addition and it's a very welcome one. Okay, cool. So right here, you can see our text. We, we, we have a bunch of options here. You can also see when I press return, let's say I want to have a uh, paragraph spacing. I can click right here and add in paragraph spacing. Let's say like a value of eight or let's say a value of 12. So then this way you can have more control over that. So the same way that you might want to control text and like, let's say HTML, you can have that control here. If you want to dig in, if let's say you're a typography buff and you really want to go into the advanced type settings, you'll notice that there are many more options that are available here, uh, as well as details that you can modify with that existing font. So let's say if you're coming from like a graphic design background or you're just a very big typography buff and you want to have control over ligatures, letter forms, alternates, you can adjust and modify those here. And there's actually a really fantastic preview that demonstrates that up above. Okay, so I can set my kerning pairs, right? A lot of people don't realize that these options are here. Let's say if you are going to make a quote, like a social media quote, you can select this text, turn on hanging punctuation, and you'll see that that quote now hangs the way that it should, uh, according to how most designers would prefer it to. Okay, so that's the text tool in a nutshell. Um, I don't see any questions about that. So I'm going to continue on. Uh, next in is shapes. Now shapes in Figma is going to be your foundation for most everything. When you're generating UI, when you're designing a website, you're going to be creating the foundation of your design based off of a lot of shapes. So here we have a, a rectangle, we have a circle, we have a star. All of those shapes are going to be located up here. And they're much more than just shapes. They have a lot of hidden features. So when I click and drag, right? So when I click and drag, you notice these little dots and those little dots allow me to apply a radius to that rectangle. Let me make it a bit darker for those of you in the back so you can see that. Here we go. I can apply that radius. Now, any of these properties that I'm applying to this rectangle are going to be over here. You can see its width, you can see its height, you can see its angle of rotation, and you can see that corner radius, right? That corner radius is right there and I can fully control that. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. I, I want to make sure that folks really understand how text works. Okay. So this shape, I've, I've been able to modify it in all these ways. So here I can control the fill. So when I come down here, once again, any object that you have selected on your canvas, you modify its properties over here at the right. Also, you'll notice Everything that gets added to the canvas, you will see it show up here in that layers panel. So you can see that this rectangle that I added to my canvas is called rectangle 6,260. I make a lot of rectangles. So I can actually just go ahead and, and I can name that. So like, let's say if that was like my title area, I can call this title area. Uh, to do, which key do you press to change the settings of a shape 
from the info panel um you just you just select the the shape and then here the settings will show up just so just by selecting it um you will see those properties and then if i wanted to change one of those properties such as the fill color when i click on it then i can begin to to modify it so right here i'm changing the color of this particular rectangle and you can add in multiple fills so i can add in a, another fill uh this fill can be a gradient and you can see that it is a linear gradient so if i wanted to add in a bit of casting of a shadow um, i could even adjust its uh, visibility and i can adjust its visibility here um, and then here i can manually represent this and this is all what is known as as vector graphics so this is is very large very small can be scaled kind of indefinitely so as i'm drawing this gradient right? It is using vector graphics to map this out. It's the same way that it may be mapped out using like HTML, CSS, or any interface design tool. Okay. So uh, once again, that shape, if I bring its radius all the way down, I get a fun little pill shape. And even as I, I resize it, you see that those corners are nicely maintained and they don't warp because this is a non-destructive property of this shape. So let's say I go ahead and I draw in an ellipse. So an ellipse is a, the circle tool. Um, so here we go. I've drawn this out. Now, one fun thing about Figma's ellipses is that there is this little dot that shows up when you hover over it. And when you hover over it, you see the cursor change to a little arc and it says arc tool. That allows you to turn this circle into a little pie chart, right? So this is gonna be great when you are generating UI that sort of represents that visual data. I can click the ratio from the sensor and expand that out and I can modify its start point as well. So if you look over here on the left, you can see the start, the sweep, the ratio. Those are the three properties that you begin to modify when you adjust that circle. So let's say if you wanted to make an activity monitor UI, I can duplicate this here. And I'm actually going to show you the secret to making it perfect, right? A lot of people, they come at me and they say, hey, I generated this. And then I rounded the corners, you know, and I was a little underwhelmed by how that looked, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit underwhelmed at how that looked as well. So I'm going to show you how to make it perfect, right? So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this ratio. I'm going to drag it all the way to 100%. And you see here this fill and the stroke. What I want to do is I want to swap the fill in the stroke, right? So I'm going to hit that command P and I'm going to type in swap fill and stroke, right? So I say swap fill and stroke and there's the shortcut key. It's shift X. If you've used illustrator before, it's the same shortcut key as swapping the fill in the stroke. So when I do that now, oops, somebody's asking me to huddle. So when I do that, it swaps the fill and stroke and I can expand that and now this is a stroke. And when I click on my ellipses here, I could set my endpoints to round. So now I get a much nicer rounded edge. So if I want to make my little, you know, activity bars, I can copy this. I'm going to hit command C. It's going to be control C if you're on windows and then paste command V or control V on windows. You can also, so I can scale that down. I'm scaling that down using the shift and the option key. It's going to be the shift and the alt key on windows. If I just hold the shift key, it, it scales to the left. If I just hold the alt key, it scales from the middle, but shift and alt, both of those modifier keys together, it'll scale to the middle and I can keep that rotational point just as I had it, and I can change its color. So you can do that one more time, and now I'm going to hit Command D. So Command D or Control D if you're on Windows is the duplicate key. So I just duplicated it, and you'll notice over here I just made another one. So now I can scale that down and rotate it. So Figma has these takes on shapes that allows you to build more intuitive user interfaces. Okay, so let's take a look at another shape really quick. Let's take a look at the polygon shape. The polygon shape, I kind of love when you draw it out the first time, 
right? And so what I do when I draw these out is I hold down that shift key. If I don't push the shift key, it'll go any which way. When I hold the shift key, it'll keep its proportions constrained and keep them nice and even. So I draw this triangle out and you might say, and I've actually seen designers that are very well-versed, right? I'm talking about professional designers not understand why there's a little bit of extra space at the bottom of this triangle. The reason there's a little extra space at the bottom of this triangle is because it allows you to center the triangle according to its physics sensor, right? Like its center of mass. So if I was to make a play button so let's say I press the O key and I draw a circle and I take this triangle, I'm going to hold down the option key to duplicate it. Let's bring it up. Let's bring it in front of the other ones. I can right click and bring it to front. And I can also see that shortcut key. Ooh, right bracket. Let's use that right bracket. I brought it to the front and I can rotate this to the side and scale this down. I could take these two shapes, select them and center and center. And you look at how nice that looks. And it looks that nice because its bounds are set to properly center that triangle. Look, if I didn't do that, let's say I take this triangle and I'm going to hit, for me, it is, um, oops, for me, it is Command E, um, otherwise known as flatten. So if I right click, I can choose flatten. And when I flatten that shape, it no longer has its non-destructive properties, right? So it no longer has those bounds. Now, if I was to take this and center it and put it in the circle, or better yet, let's duplicate these. I'm going to select these both hold down the option key, the alt key, if you're on windows, I'm going to hold down, drag that down. If I press, you know, command E to flatten it and I censor this, you, you notice the difference between the two. So the reason that Figma might have a little bit more bounding area surrounding the polygons is because it allows you to more intuitively censor it as a user interface element, as opposed to an object that has very strict bounds. So let's just delete that. And let's also look at how this can be adjusted. So here I can click and drag and you will see more count points. As I drag this, you can see I can adjust this polygon as needed. There we go. What do you think of that? Also here I can round out those corners. And once again, I can add a stroke value and the stroke value, I can apply it to the center, the inside, the outside. Let's give this a more pronounced stroke and increase that size so you can see it there. So I've just drawn this out. And once again, this is a vector object, so it can be scaled large and small. Cool. Next up, let's talk about the pencil. I'm not going to spend too much time on the pencil today. Uh, we do have a previous workshop where we've covered the pencil more in depth. It's called Working with Vector Objects, uh, but I will cover it just basically here so you can begin to see how Figma works a little bit different than other vector applications. So here I'm going to draw a point. I'm going to hit the shift key and draw it another point here. I'm going to hold that shift key and click it up here. And you'll see that I'm drawing these lines. So if this pen tool continues to stick, you'll notice that we're currently in a vector editing mode. I hit the escape key to like exit that. And one cool thing about Figma is that when I select this point here, I can actually draw another line and you'll see that it connects. And let's hit the escape key again. So I can increase the stroke on that value. And this point now acts as a corner. So one that thing that's really cool about Figma is that when you draw out these lines, right, you can draw out additional segments and this line can take multiple points. This is very different than how other vector applications work. And it's an optimization that allows you to create better iconography and icons. So here, let's say too, I'm, I'm designing this, this icon and I want this edge to be round because I have multiple lines ed adding to that point, right? And then I go over here and I try to round that edge. You see it not working. That's because you need to round it in a different way. So I'm going to select my vector shape come over here to the right 
and I can choose this join right here. You'll see the advanced stroke panel. I could type in a rounded corner join. And that means that my corners will now be rounded. Let's say I want to round off those edges as well. I don't have to do any crazy math or anything. I can select those points. I can come over once again to this advanced stroke pet menu and choose that endpoint. I can have it be round. One cool thing about that too is that other objects that you create, let's just say you make a simple line and you want, uh, let's, let's bring this line out. So let's say uh, this is right now grouped inside of this one. Let me hit done and I'm going to create a new line with my pen tool. Uh, let's make that a little bit thicker. And here, what I can do is I can change these endpoints. So I can make you know, a dot on one side and I can make an arrow on the other side. And then what's cool is I can move this around. And those of you that are familiar with pen tools is that I can hold down the command key and actually, you know, draw out its curves uh, in a way that allows me to make that shape much more organic. Now that bend tool can be found up here, right? So this bend tool allows you to bend and morph that shape. So bend tool will allow me to adjust that as well. And if I want to at any point reset those curves, I can hold down the command key or control key on windows and just click on those points uh, and it'll take it back uh, to its original points. Cool. All right. So images fills on images are fills on shapes. So if I draw a rectangle, if I draw any shape, right? I can actually have a bunch of these. Let's make one rounded and let's make our ellipse and let's open that up. Let's bring out the middle and close it. So we have here a bunch of shapes. Images are just fills on these shapes. So if I go over here to the top left file, place image, and you'll see that there's that shortcut key, shift command K. Another way to do this is, um, command P or control P and type in a uh, place image. There we go. Place image. Now I can add images from my desktop. So I see a, a file browser right here. I'm not quite sure if it's being shared on the zoom, but I can basically add in photos from my desktop and you'll see the UI change. So up here in the top, it says click or drag to place, place all, discard all. So I can just click and it's gonna add that image or I can click on a shape and I can click on a shape and it'll add the image there as well. So I'll show you that one more time. I'm gonna hit command P and I'm gonna type in place image and we are going to select one of these shapes that I have here and just select that shape and click. And then you can see that the, uh, the, the, the image is now in there. So as I adjust my shape, that image is essentially a fill on that shape. To adjust it, I can select that image. I can come over to the fill and you'll see that there's different options. I can do some light image adjustments that are placed on top of that image. And I can also adjust how it is cropped. So right here, it is currently applied as a fill. So what a fill means, it's doing its best to try to fill up that image or the area provided by the shape. And what I can do instead is I can say, let's put it into crop mode so I can manually adjust how I want this image to be cropped in this space, right? Yo, Figma is legit like OP. Like that's what I'm saying. All right, so that's gonna give us the ability to do that. And like, let's say I wanted to apply another color fill on top of this image. I can go to fill hit plus, let's add a color, let's go fuchsia, let's make its opacity 100%. But now let's apply a blend mode. A blend mode will allow us to apply that color to the image that's sitting just beneath it. So if I apply like a difference blend mode, right, we got something that's looking very Lisa Frank. Um, so here I can go to that fill once again, make an adjustment. And, you know, now we got like a, a web visualizer, a music visualizer from the 90s. Okay. So here I can adjust that blend mode to, you know, do different things. So let's say I just want to apply this color to that image. Now, 
let's say I have that fill. If I copy over here to the left, I can hit Command C, Control C if you're on Windows. I can paste it onto other objects as well. So you can see that this object has the image fill with the color fill, the image fill with the color fill. There's a lot that you can extrapolate from that. So continue, try, play that through and, and see what else you can do to push that. You could have as many fills as you want there. Okay, cool. So next I'm gonna click on arranging, resizing and scaling. Uh, in Figma, you have some really cool options to arrange your objects. So here I'm gonna select these objects here. And when I select them, you'll see this little icon appear at the lower right. And what that means is it'll allow me to auto arrange those objects as best as it can. So I'm gonna hit undo, let's hit command Z. And you'll see this little object over here can also be found in the top right when you select those objects right here in more options. This is called tidy up. So here, uh, someone asked really quickly how to add video in Figma. Um, to add video in Figma, you just have to have your file be on an education team or a pro team and just drag it right in the same way that you would place an image. So adding video is, is the same way as adding images. Um, however, video only plays in prototyping mode. And that's something that we're not going to cover here today. But feel free to check out Figma's YouTube to look on video prototyping. All right, cool. So let's let's do this again. So arranging objects, I'm gonna select all of these objects here. Actually, I'm gonna make one of them red because I'm gonna show you something a little bit fun with that one. I'm gonna select all of these objects. I'm gonna come over here and choose tidy up. Now they've all been tidied up. Now, once those objects have been tidied up, you're gonna see these little circles and lines kind of wonder what's going on there. This is gonna allow me to adjust the spacing between those objects. So I can click and drag and adjust the spacing. And once again, those properties are available over here in the panel. So I could say, oh, I want there to be 64 pixels and 64 pixels uh, or units uh, between those objects. So now they're all perfectly aligned with one another. And uh, if I want to rearrange them, let's say I select this red one and I move it up, you'll see that they'll begin to rearrange. Now you might be saying, yo, Mig, I see you're moving it up, but like, why is that kind of breaking the grid? Let's say you want to swap this one with one in the corner. If you hold down the command key, it will swap with whatever one you just currently had selected. So here I can select this and I can choose blue. So I can select them both. I'm gonna hold down the command key and I can move it. So someone just asked a question, how do I create a table in Figma? There is this tool called auto layout in Figma that should give you the ability to create tables. Um, however, it is a little bit more advanced. It's not something we're covering today. You can click up here into the resources, go to plugins and type in table. Um, and there's a table creator plugin uh, that is made by one of our community creators, uh, Gavin. So I believe it's called Table Creator. Uh, here we go by Gavin McFarland. So you can run this as a plugin uh, and it'll easily create a table for you in Figma. So that's going to be my short answer to that. So click right here, go to plugins. That's going to give you the opportunity to do that. Shout out to Gavin McFarland for that. So Something that we haven't quite yet covered, but is so essential to Figma is frames. When you are designing objects in Figma, chances are you're gonna be designing it for a device. So here we have a number of different frames. I'm gonna show you how to create them. Frames are containers for your designs. So when I press the F key, uh, I can draw out a frame. Another shortcut key for that is the A key. So if you're coming from a tool like Sketch and you're used to referring to them as artboards with the A key, the A key also works in Figma. So I'll show you that one more time. Press the F key and I draw a frame. When I draw the frame, you're gonna see the frame over here on the left side added to your layer panel. And just like these other objects here, they can nest things. So once I begin to add shapes and 
uh, rectangles or images or text and objects, you'll notice that they are now nested inside of that frame. One cool thing that I forgot to mention here too, is that when you double click on a layer in your layers panel, it'll go right to it. So you see here, we've been kind of following these sections. When you want to just focus in on one object, you can dig into like its hierarchy, uh, wherever it's nested uh, and just double click on it in the layers panel to help you quickly find the thing that you may be looking for. Okay, cool. So frames. Sorry, there's a lot of packed information on this. Once again, this session is being recorded. So you will be shared with a recording so you can go back at this at your own uh, uh, speed. You can watch this at you know 0.5 speed or 5X speed, whichever is your preferred option. So F key, I'm gonna draw that out. When I draw the frame tool uh, will be selected over here on the right. And here I can choose different options of different devices. Now, the sizes of these devices are based off of the device's viewport. So whenever you're designing an interface, you want to design for its viewport. Uh, so designing interfaces is going to be scaling that out. Um, if you've used an application like Illustrator, Illustrator is for illustration. So it has a different sizing for devices that are actually based off of the device pixels. You never want to design an interface to the physical dimensions of a device. So you might see a larger number and a smaller number when you look up a device's size. You want to design to that smaller number because you're going to be designing to its proper viewport. And so in Figma, when you look at the dimensions of these objects, you are designing to its viewport. So want to identify that really quickly. All right, so somebody is asking like, so there's a few advanced questions in here. Someone asked me how to, to, to blur background and keep the forefront. I'll just, I'll just cover that really quickly. Let's say I have a few objects here, right? So I have one, two, three, four. Let's say I want to blur the objects behind. I could draw a rectangle. Uh, I'm gonna make it white. And so this white rectangle, I'm going to come down here to effects. So this is something I haven't yet covered. And you'll see that there's drop shadow, right? So I can add drop shadow, right? That's one effect. But the really cool effect that we have in here is background blur. Background blur is an option that you have in CSS and in web design that allows you to blur the objects behind you. However, when I drop this into my frame, you notice that the objects behind it aren't blurred and you're probably like, why? And that's because its opacity is set to 100%. You can't see the objects behind it. So when I select that, I can come to this layer and um, you'll notice I can go multiply, but you'll notice the objects aren't actually showing through. So I'll show you how that works. You go to the fill color and apply a multiply, right? Now that'll work. I'll show you that one more time. So you go to the fill color and you apply a multiply to a white layer. Now I can set a very large background blur to the objects that are sitting behind it. So there we go. So now anything that is behind this layer is effectively blurred out. And if I want to, I could even change the color of that. So let's say if I have like a blue blur with things behind it. So I know it's an effect that people are constantly trying to represent in UI. So that's how you do it. All right. Uh, next up, so working with frames now, if you have a lot of frames, so let's say I have a few frames, I've been designing this amazing interface, and you want to collect them all together. Once again, you can select them, you can tidy them up, you can adjust the spacing between them, and you can wrap them in what is known as a section. So I press, uh, if I go up here, you can see there's a section option, it's shift S. So shift S, I could draw a section, and sections are great in that I can give it a background color and I can move them around together. Um, and you'll notice this little icon that shows up that allows you to uh, alert a developer that it's ready for development. Um, so not really going to concern ourselves too much with that, but just wanted to highlight that it's there. So if there is anybody that's here, that's like, you know, working with an engineer and are looking for that kind of communication in Figma, that'll give you that option right there. 
All right, so we're coming up close one time. I'm going to spend about five more minutes just to cover resizing frames and constraints, as well as the scale tool. So this is really important because I feel that folks just learning Figma for the first time are trying to resize objects on their canvas, and they get very confused as to why things aren't scaling the way that they expect. So here is a frame. Right. And so this frame right now, uh, when I resize this frame, you'll see this square that's inside. And you're like, yo, Mig, why isn't this resizing? Right. Because you're not actually scaling it. So somebody asked really quick from dev mode, can we extract HTML? Uh, yes. In dev mode, if I go over here, turn on dev mode and I select something, uh, I can actually grab CSS. Uh, and encode uh, to kind of represent it. So as I move around in here, dev mode gives you the opportunity to kind of get that inside view. So quick answer to that. So once again, constraints. When I resize this, you notice that this isn't scaling. So if I was to add some text, like let's say I'm just gonna put in the word title, let's make that title text a little bit bigger. And when I go to resize this, it's not resizing. And that's because when you're resizing a frame, you actually don't want things to just get bigger and move all over the place unless you tell it to. So what constraints allow you to do when you select any object that's inside of a frame, you'll see this little panel called constraints. Let's just highlight it over here. And it's basically instructing the objects that are inside of your frame, how you want them to behave. So right now, this object is set to left and top. If I set it to top and right, when I resize this, the object is going to follow that right corner. If I move this down and I say, okay, I want you to be left and right. So it's going to apply the left and right, but also the bottom. When I apply this, right, it's instructing it on how to behave. Same thing with this text. Let's say I want it to be in the middle of the frame. I can say center and center. So now when this frame gets adjusted, it's constantly moving from the center. The reason is, is this is how you begin to think of objects as being responsive. So oftentimes you just want to scale something, right? You're like, okay, I really want this, but I just need it twice as big for one reason or another. I can select this. There's a different tool for scaling. If you look up here under the move tool, it's called the scale tool. The shortcut for that is the K key. When I press K, you'll notice that the interface changes over here on the right. And we now get the scale tool. I can scale objects a number of different ways. I can scale it by 2X. I can even choose, let me hit undo, to scale it from the top left at 2X, right? I can make it 3X. Right? Or I can type in a designated size that I want it to be by just typing that value out right. So I can say 460, right? And now it goes to a width of 460. So the scale tool allows you to scale objects, whereas when you're normally using the, um, the move tool, you're, you're, you're moving the constraint. So I press the V key, I'm back on the move tool. So the reason that is, is when you're making things, you know, responsive for the web, you need to consider how objects might be adjusted. Right. Once again, that scale tool, right. If I were to just, you know, adjust and move things, I can apply constraints. And even here, there are scale constraints. So I can set scale constraints, which will scale, you know, that object in there. One last thing that I'm gonna cover with that is that as you're making layouts, you can also apply grids. So when I press the F key and I draw out a frame, let's say I draw out a MacBook Air screen um, and I want to apply an underlaying grid. I can click on layout grids and here I can choose to have column set, a row set or just an outright grid. So I'm going to choose columns. I'm going to set 12 columns. I'm going to apply margins of 32 and a gutter. That's the spacing in between the columns as being 16. And right now they're set to stretch. And the reason they're set to stretch is because that's often how responsive dot design is considered. 
So um, here I can adjust that count. I can move it down. So I could say 10 rows, eight, seven, six, five, four. And you can adjust this number right there. The cool thing, and I think is like just really a nice innovation in Figma is the ability to overlay multiple grids. So let's say if I wanted to apply rows, those of you who are like, you know, typography buffs and you want a good baseline grid, I can set auto rows. I can align them from the top excuse me, and set it as eight height with zero gutter. So I can apply many different options. I've just created a baseline grid in my layout and I can even adjust the colors as I see fit. Now, the cool thing about working with grids is you can actually create a grid style. So let's say if I had another frame, I can either, I can copy and paste these grids right? You can just copy and paste by selecting all the way to the left, holding the shift key, clicking all the way to the left, copy, and I can paste it out to this other layer. Or I can come up here to the four dots. Anytime you see the four dots in Figma, it's going to be related to creating a style. I can create a grid style and uh, I'm going to call this uh, new grid, new grid, new grid who this. So when I apply it to a frame, there it is. Now, if I make any adjustments to this grid, right? Let's say, you know, I want to hide the rows or hide the columns, or let's say instead of 12 columns, I go down to, you know, six, uh, it will be applied across the entire document. So how cool is that? All right. So let's head on over to Q&A. Wow. We got a lot of Q&A. Uh, Maybe some I cannot believe how many questions we have how lucky i feel like that's the best thing for a professor to have the way that i've organized these from start to beginning is from left to right so if you go all the way down the left panel first and then move on from there there were some really great great basics questions Perfect. what i'm also going to do and throw it is throw in the chat a session feedback and future workshop topic um form so before you log off today, please give us some feedback about this workshop and suggest future topics if there's still things you have questions about. But Migs, I'll pass it over to you. In total, you have 24 questions. And so let's uh, let's blast through it. All right, cool. So first thing, how would I explain section versus frame? Uh, frame is kind of like one level of organization, right? You define that space and you kind of move it on. The frame itself, uh, you can use it in prototyping. It's actually the frame of your device. So if you have a collection of frames, you can use a section to organize that, right? So consider a section as a method of organization within Figma itself, but the frames are kind of like the, the design primitive. They're, they're your artboards where you actually design. So within the section, you can put a bunch of things. So uh, I see a question, is there a wor workshop on variables? There was two weeks ago. You can actually check it out on Figma's YouTube under the Figma for Education playlist. All right. So is there a way to define a gradient as a style and then apply it to other places? Absolutely. If I draw this rectangle and let's create a gradient here, let's create a radial gradient. Let's have it go from red to dark red and let's have that dark red. There we go. So I have this wonderful gradient that I want to apply to many other places. I can click styles. I can create a new style. Uh, one second, I think, why is this? It shouldn't, they changed the interface on me. Uh, okay, here we go. Sorry. Uh, so here I click plus, I create a new style. So I call this, you know, gradient blob, right? And so now I have gradient blob. So now if I have a new object, such as an ellipse, I can go here and I can apply my gradient blob. If I have, you know, a star, right? I can apply my gradient blob. You could even apply images as those styles as well. Can we over, over frames versus groups? The primary difference between a frame versus group, think of a group as being kind of like a temporary, you know, grouping of objects. Uh, a frame defines the width and the height of an object. The group's width and height are defined by the objects inside of it. So if I was to have a bunch of rectangles here, when I select them, and I hit Command G or Control G on Windows, this is now a group. 
I can't affect its width and height. The objects inside of the group define its width and height. So you think of those as kind of like a temporary like grouping of objects. It's best used for illustrations, uh, but a frame themselves is how you want to refer to like a container. So if you think about web development, it might be like a div container. Um, so these are a bit more structural and they're uh, a bit more formal in terms of how you might articulate your design. Uh, next, is there a way to make any changes to the text automatically apply to the label of the text in the layer section? I, I, if I change text to label, it can auto read label. Um, so here, when you type text in, that text will be highlighted over here. It'll be called that, but you can label it yourself. So, you know, I could just call this title. And now when I adjust the text, it'll just be whatever it is. So you can rename that text in this panel. The shortcut key to rename is going to be command R. Any layer that you have selected and you hit command R, you'll notice that you can now edit its title in the layers panel. So control R on Windows, command R on Mac. And if you have a bunch of objects and you hit command R, you will actually get an interface UI that will give you the opportunity to rename multiple objects at once. So I can call these all, I'll just call them all squares, right? So square, type in number, and now they've all been renamed to square one, two, three, and four. So isn't a zoom tool generally a magnifying glass icon in Figma? So if you hold down the Z key, if you hold down the Z key, that's another way to zoom. So if I hold down the option key while I'm holding the Z key, it'll zoom out. So it's just another way to zoom. You press Z, you click drag, you could zoom in, hold down Z, press option or alt if you're on Windows and you can click right there and zoom out. Uh, how to create table in Figma. I already answered that with the table creator plugin. Uh, that's going to be your best option. Once you start getting a little bit more advanced, you might want to consider creating it using auto layout. And uh, there's plenty of, of different tutorials on that online. Uh, how do I save an entire file as one flattened layer akin to a screen grab would? So it, you might not really want to do that. Like it's not necessarily something that you would want to have an entire file, but let's say if you collect a bunch of stuff as a section. So if I press shift S and then I have, you know, like all of these images in here and I want to have this exported, when I select it, I can come over here to this export option. Um, and so this will now have these export settings. So I can save it as a PNG, a JPEG, or even as a PDF. So I can export this whole thing out as a PDF and there it is, it's downloaded as section two and you can see it right here. So that might be a better answer to your question. I would highly, highly stay away from exporting an entire file as a PDF as not a best practice, but export smaller pieces as multiple PDFs. If you have a bunch of these set up, another way that you can export is file export frames to PDF. And what that'll do is it'll find all of the frames in the current page that you're in and then export those as one big PDF. So this is actually a big favorite of mine, uh, but it helps to have these export settings uh, on them as well. Okay, boom. All right, how are we doing on time? I think we've gone over. All right, so uh, that's gonna be it for today, but guess what? If you want to hang on and you would like me to answer some more of these questions and talk more about Figma, uh, I am going to have a bit of a workshop after party. Uh, I'm basically going to start this new series called Homework Hotline. You can catch me over on Twitch TV. Uh, I'm going to be switching over right now uh, at the end of this workshop. So you can come and see me on Twitch TV, Miggy from Figma. I'm going to spend about another hour, hour 15 minutes there. Uh, and probably answer some questions there as well. Remember that this workshop is being recorded. Oops, uh, it is being recorded. It will be sent out to you within, uh, by early next week. You'll also find it on the YouTube channel. And like I said, if you want to hang out a little bit longer, come find me on Switch. I'm gonna spend about an hour starting now uh, answering some more of these questions uh, and going over some additional basics in Figma. Once again, be sure to fill out that Q&A. It lets us know how we're doing, how we can serve you better. And once again, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it and wish you the best on your education journeys. Thank you, Alex.